please, depending on your opinion. So cool, like you've had your time, like continue to make money from the producer's chair and let some new people in. Some of these people might have better ideas than you. They might even have more ideas than you because your idea is boom. And a slow spin around somebody screaming someone's name. <laughs> There, that was actually the new Friday the 13th, that was the thing that I noticed was that everybody that, you know, in, our, in the description for this panel talked about the Abercrombie and Fitch model. Yeah. There was not an ugly person in that movie at all. Now if you kind of go back through the canon, there were, there were, there was, there was at least a like, cornucopia of people. There was the pretty person that might survive or would be the best death, you know, or whatever. But it was, it was at least a scale of people. It wasn't just pretty people walking around threatening to get killed. All I mean, all ugly people. But you want people that you can relate to, right? I think that that's where a lot of the 80s films and a lot of the stuff that we're remaking, that when you saw some of these characters, they were people that, people, the people, yeah, they were people, like, you know, they pulled these characters off the street and was like, hey, you want to do a horror movie versus going, and, oh, it's ever going to be model day. You'll yeah, work. they think about, like, Kevin Bacon was the hottest person in the you know, they're yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it certainly doesn't look like that. Right. Um, I think, uh, where's this called? Oh, Cheers. To me, what happened, if you look at TV with Cheers, Cheers is a really great example of where you can make a successful show without depending on just pretty people. You had like Ted Danson, uh, Shelley Long, and Kirstie Allen. That was it. And everybody else was kind of marked on, but they were great performers. Bay, it seems like when the people that he gets under his under his wing, they're not they're not shopping for talent. They're shopping for a picture first, talent second, and that's I think where a lot of times it falls under its own weight. Well, when your audition is watching watching his car. Yeah. <laughs> well, was it to Rolls Royce? Did she have to go into that song? Yeah, <laughs> 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 like lens players and. Uh, lens players. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Explosion. There was yeah. a big explosion yeah. in the background. You <laughs> 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 something up and that was it. Well, for most, in all fairness, for most of us horse stuff, they had very little to do with anything. Which said, why they were decent? Well, some of them. I mean, the, the sad thing is there are a lot of people in Hollywood who screw stuff up all on their own. And they don't need Michael Bay's help for influence mm -hmm. anyway. Um, I actually did a lot of work uh, magazine wise, talking to a lot of people who worked on the Nightmare on Elm Street. And a lot of the scripts happened that had nothing to do with my work. There was someone else involved, I won't say anything. I would say they get a chair, but past that. Um, and it, I know the screenwriter was pulling his hair out uh, over it. Yeah, because the, the script that's written for Nightmare on Elm Street is actually one of the best horror scripts. The remake mm -hmm. of it is one of the best horror scripts ever in the past 10 years. Oh, so, uh, yeah. And then they made the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and to get, I mean, one of the things you probably all heard about that there were massive reshoots on. Yeah, the reshoots were entirely because of things the person who gets the chair did the same. Yeah, which I won't go into too much detail because I was told to talk about. But you want to come up afterwards to talk about it. <laughs> and the story just to set me mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things that I've noticed is that they just break so many cardinal rules. Like, first of all, if you're going to make a Jason reboot, in my opinion, you better fucking kill every second. Like, one of the prime moments, like watching this movie, and one of the characters goes outside, he turns around and says, I have to go get him. I'll be, Jason should jump off the rope and cut him in half. Mm -hmm. That should be where that goes. He doesn't go all the way out to the cabin and have a, oh my god, moment. And then come right, no, Jason just kills him. The body counts need to be every movie in one. That's, well, you know, they tried to do that. They got the first three movies with Mother and the pre and the prologue. They got the bag over the head before he finds the mask. So they, they covered a great amount in the beginning. There was a lot of promise. But they tried to get backstory in there and give Jason a heart and some thinking moments. I was waiting for him to start talking. You know, I was waiting for him to like, talk him up and he's like, I have to do this. Or, you know, and it was going to be Shia LaBeouf, you know, coming out there. <laughs> Somehow. Yeah, in our defense, we didn't know that they were both going to be here. I had no idea. The lack of focus or over focus in stories really is what, in the horror movies, is really to start to suffer that and making it too long. Where they try to get, like, it's Jason, he never talks, he just killed, he's dead. You know why he does it, and then and it's over. You just move forward from that point. It's aliens, they're coming down, they're shooting, you already know what's going on. Um, they, with Transformers, fucking. 
this, they want the, you to be invested in the family, what's going on with the dog and his bro, like, who cares? <laughs> These are the people, get to the robots, and they kill each other. That's what we wanted to see. That movie's half people, half robots. That's not what the show was at all. Like, you're ruining your source. That's his problem. Too. He's the new Tim Burton for disregarding where things came from before he bastardized them. The other thing that comes up that I've noticed uh, in these reboots is like Halloween and uh, Friday the 13th. How they try and give the villain some sympathy or the nightmare on the screen, really? But I thought Rob's going to be successful with that. Uh, really? I, I thought what he did with my mind. Rob's not big, he should be his family. Next year's family. I just feel that, like, you know, it's like I don't want to sympathize with, with Jason. Mm. You know, the fact that, you know, he's a returning well, kid. Yeah, he's gonna, I think the biggest problem with most remakes. Despite popular belief, remakes are actually still a very, very small percentage of what Hollywood puts out of here. But I think the biggest problem most people have is they're, made, they're doing a remake for no purpose. Right. Mm -hmm. That we're just trying to, to do this exact same story again. If you're going to remake it, everyone. Well, they're doing it for the money. I mean, they're just doing it for the money. They're not doing it because we have something new to do with right. this idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look, you look, there are tons of successful remakes that we all love. We all love John Carpenter's The Thing. Mm -hmm. I think it was a remake. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why not? Um, Invasion of the Honest Hatchers. Any version of it is a remake. Dawn, Dawn, of, the Dead. Dawn of the Dead is a remake. You know, there are, there are great remakes out there that we all love. But the problem is when, yeah, you get a lot of these, like we've been talking about, you know, these big franchises that they want to reboot for no reason except to reboot them. How many people saw the New Evil Dead? Now, those hands, how many people like the New Evil Dead? Alright, fair. That's good. Yeah. Right. That, that makes me glad. Because I actually was really impressed with that. I felt yeah. like, but again, they're doing it this time. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. weren't just trying to remake the same thing. It, well, it, it was its own. It had, it had its own flavor, but it paid tribute to some stuff. It didn't have the exact same story, but it, the new stuff didn't feel like fluff. It was, it was good. I thought it was the same. I think one of the keys to that is that they set out to make, they stuck true to what the original was. They went to make a serious movie. When Raimi did the original Evil Dead, he was making a serious, over-the-top gore movie, and they did that with the new remake. And in a couple of years, everyone would be like, oh my god, this is hilarious, it can't be overly bloody. Mm -hmm. But at this very moment, it was still serious enough that it still held true to what it was. Yeah, actually, at the showing that we went to for it, and a guy a couple of rows ahead was a like all over the place. Awesome. It was pretty yeah, cool. that was a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Start issuing buckets from the <laughs> Only two bags will be allowed. Right. <laughs> hmm. Hitchcock. I mean, I, I, when we talk about extreme gore at the end of the, the weekend, but I thought he, he's really the master of implied stuff. You well, know, so we made one of those. Which one did he remake? He remade yeah, um, What? Yeah, he made one Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah, he did it again. Oh, he did it originally, and then he basically. It was one of his first movies when he had no money to um, yep. And then years later, he's like, you know what? I don't want to do that movie the way as, as, a, as I always intended. Universal has his first few movies from the 20s in collection. You know, it's hard to get through his first few movies before he really started gaining ground uh, in the 50s. But uh, what was the awful movie? He did one of the old power movies. He did um, Easy Richard, but he did it as <laughs> he did it as like they, to give you an idea. They just made that movie again. It's like a, a period British comedy, and Alfred Hitchcock did it as a courtroom drama. I think so. <laughs> I think we already started talking about us where you know that he wasn't directing. Maybe helps that they weren't as frantically put together. But I was at least happy about that because the moment you see his name, for a lot of us, that's just a canker. It's like you just bit your mouth in half that you see his name at all. It doesn't matter in what capacity. But um, to see those. Uh, the new the new revamps. At least the cutting was maybe half of what it is in a lot of those action films where I could see what was going on, I knew who was attacked and who was getting attacked. They at least had that going for it. So I, I'll, I'll tip my hat to them at least pulling back what has kind of become his signature stuff. There's not a whole bunch of mm -hmm. slow-mo, there's not a whole bunch of just masturbatory crap that was in there. So mm -hmm. they get that. I like the Alfred Hitchcock movies that they made me interact with. Just from the screenshots and stuff, they made you want to yell out and say, "Hey, put yeah. the bomb underneath the table!" Well, Go they, away. The way he shot stuff, he planned things to kind of bring you into it. Yeah. You know, if he really, if he really brought you into it with a lot of establishing stuff, and uh, and then sometimes lingering to make you sort of uncomfortable and actually yeah. realize what just happened. Right, thank you. Like the bird is a good one. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Sitting on the bench, just smoking a cigarette. Next thing you see a crow. Jim. 
Yeah. Next thing the camera pans somewhere else, and next thing you know, when the camera comes back to her, there's like five more. Uh, you know, it's like, uh oh. Yeah. See, but the vertical is a good example of something that is okay to remake because now the technology will make it yeah. make it believable. You can make it credible. All right. right. Yeah. We can come up with slightly more reasoning than they just mm -hmm. decided to do. Right. Right. Exactly. Like I mean, you know, from the mid late eighties, the, the special effects that we're doing at that time were awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we can probably do it a little better now, but not enough to really justify it. You know, I think you have to have, you know, if you're doing like John Carpenter's thing. Yeah. That's a good example. Like you like the original? You, well, we went in a totally different direction. They're two That's different right. movies, and you can kind of see that they're that they both came out of the goes there, the original uh, Campbell story. But yeah, I mean, when they made the movie in the fifties, they were doing the haze code still. You know, they just a studio thing. We have to put a love interest in mm. because there's always love interest. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is. Um, and then when they got when John Carpenter got to do it, he said, "Well, wait, we actually have the technology and the building. Let's actually do a story." All the weird blood tests. The new remake after that, the last okay. thing that came out was the sort of prequel, the thing prequel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I watched that and I, when I got to the end of it, I looked at her and I was like, it's pretty bad or worse. But the best part of your movie is the fucking credit loss. Okay, so watch it too. Well, yeah, it was pretty interesting. I think that some of the things that makes the whole movie really great is that you get to use your imagination a little bit. I think Cloverfield would have been. Amazing movie had it ended at the helicopter. If it ended at the helicopter, you never saw the monster full on, mm -hmm. it would have been great. And that's why I kind of mm -hmm. am the newest thing where it's just a big CGI orgy. Now, sometimes you don't want to see every chemical and scale on something. Well, what they did wrong with the thing, too, is I mean, in the, in the carpenter one, uh, it's psychological. People are doubting who, you know, who might be the thing, who might be trying to kill me. And then in the remake, it's this giant screaming, spiky vagina that's, you know, <laughs> 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 which is terrifying in itself. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even into that, but yeah. There, there are times where it seems like the, the balance shifts and they're kind of playing with it, trying to get it right. Or like action movies, you'll usually forgive the story for the sake of good action scenes. So you're lucky to get any kind of good story. Which is the excuse to get to the action scenes. So that's just that is kind of the meat and potatoes of it. The horror movies, there's definitely the effects, but there are times when the effects can go too far. Then you're like, hey man, did anything happen? I don't care about any of these people dying. I don't care if that person, you know, if there's no investment at all, you know, then it can go too far. So I think the the struggle that horror has always had is how do you justify that? How do you give it weight? How do you make them care about these people, or at least make you? Uh, wish they died. Like you pick the people that would die and live, and then they make they agree with you or they disappoint you. Um, I think you know as a crossover. I think the move, the series, the Predator series that's continued. Uh, ADP Requiem. If you didn't see that, forget ADP. Watch ADPR. It's outstanding. And they don't let everybody live that you think should live. And they wave the kid in front of you and like kill the ten year old kid in the first twenty minutes. And like I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> this is gonna be the best Christmas night I've ever gone to. <laughs> I thought it was outstanding for that reason. And those brothers, I can't remember their names, but I, I was really impressed with that movie. And I thought Predators also was a really good one. If you never got around to the latest one, yeah, yeah with uh, with Adrian Brody mm -hmm. and his deep voice. My biggest problem with that movie though is you watch the trailers and there's that scene where Adrian Brody really standing there and it's like, and he just gets covered and you're like, oh fuck yeah, when you're watching those trailers. Mm. And then you watch the movie. I got done with that movie and all of a sudden I was like. Wait a minute. <laughs> that never happened. Yeah, it was. They filmed like three different things for it. Yeah. Because um, they were, weren't sure what they wanted the punchline to be. There was actually an alternate ending where it turns out the woman is one of the is another alien mm. who's been brought in. And there was also an ending where Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to make a cameo. Oh, uh, so, <laughs> Which I think was what that was. They they filmed Brody's side of it. And they were playing. The whole idea was at the end that, you know, gay with the few survivors of this thing and a small army of predators show up and are covering him with a little three dot thing. Mm. And um, at the last minute, like one of them marches forward and pulls his helmet off, and it's Schwarzenegger <laughs> decked out as a predator now. <laughs> <laughs> and they, he was governing or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, with the technology thing, though, like, they can either go too far with it, 
mm -hmm. or like really, really screw them. Like in Neck and Around on the Street, I thought that, you know, the scene with all the blood in the bedroom, like, you know, CGI, you've done such an amazing job with that scene. They completely made this horrible looking thing. I mean, you could tell that it was computer generated stuff, but. No, what did you think about her flying around the room, though? Like that. Uh, I, 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 I was kind of, I wasn't sure about that one. Yeah, I, I really, truly did not like that reboot at all because, I mean, I love the original series and I, I didn't appreciate it. Find online, read the script. The script is amazing. I would like to. I know the screenwriter was pulling his hair out. I'm sure he was, yeah. I mean, one, one of his big things that he did, he researched, and it's actually come up recently, if any of you heard of Micronaps? It's this weird thing your brain does that if you stay awake too long, mm. you actually start. Parts of your brain go to sleep. But even though I could be sitting here talking, and part of my brain is asleep because I've been up for like, I think it's at like 28 hours since so that's happened. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that even if it's driving news? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, the doctors tell you that um, you, <laughs> with or without chemical help, if you stay awake a certain length of time, you, your chemical composition will go through any kind of experience that you can have on drugs. Because uh, what most of those things end up doing are causing connections that don't happen or preventing connections that normally happen. So it's it's a matter of doing something like that. So so through sleep deprivation, if you're dedicated enough, you can hit almost <laughs> I, was pretty, I was pretty dedicated in my day. I've been trying to graduate all that CGI stuff in the movie where things could like explode into the black and white people. None of that was supposed to happen. Mm. The whole idea of it was supposed to be terrifying was because you're taking these micronaps. You want to tell no. no. Because, because, he, because he pointed out that really in Nightmare on Elm Street, especially this is why the later ones get getting sort of go here and go here. Yeah. I mean, once you know you're in the dreadboard, you're screwed. Yeah. That's all there is to it. And so he thought, wouldn't it be fantastic if you had no idea? Mm -hmm. If you could be walking around building and talking to people and have no idea, are you in the dream world? Are you awake or not? They should have committed more to that. Yeah. 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 But it would have been better. Didn't they make a movie called The Matrix? <laughs> yeah, but you can tell yeah, everybody was in the dream world. Let, do we want to get to the color? I don't want to lose out on the <laughs> shitty nature of blue and orange <laughs> bit. <laughs> because the Matrix, I think, was trying to set pace for that, and I'm not even that impressed with what the Matrix did, honestly. I, I think I know. there was too much gray and almost green and blue yep. in, on, in the actual shit. There was no vibrancy in the in the real world. Uh, I mean, they, they muted it, and it was supposed to be more, uh, you know, more vibrant in this manufactured world. But because they went so green, it wasn't necessarily vibrant, it was just green. Yep. Like the crow, to me, really has that where you've got hyper red and hyper blue in his memories for the life that he no longer has. All those colors are gone in his, in his post-death life. So to me, that was the most successful uh, use of that kind of you know, color uh, technology, whether it's through uh, you know, the shot of processing or post-production. Um, yeah, I, I think the color thing is gone. Like now, all those shows, and even watching Hannibal, which I really like, it's a good series. They're they're teetering. They're in that spot because he has a lot of visions. And yeah. sometimes it goes, it starts going blue, and you've got these these fantastic morgues that would never exist. Like, can it just be a morgue? Can you just go to a morgue and shoot? So no more looks like that. You know, they don't have glass panel doors. Mm -hmm. That's not the morgue. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. We should be talking about. It. <laughs> There's no small. <laughs> so you don't like any color grading at all? I think mostly it's it's, it's no good. <laughs> I think it can be overdone. If it's well done, you love it, but you also don't notice it. That. Don't notice it. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Is there there are too many filmmakers these days who, to be honest, don't have a lot of experience. They're getting given you know these big projects and other things, and they're guys who shot a commercial. You know, mm. that you went out and wow, you shot 30 seconds of film, and now we're giving you a $4 million movie to, you know, do this remake of. And so they sledgehammer. Mm. Right. You know, and also, I, I hate to say, most all heads stop action sledgehammer stuff. <laughs> um, most film <laughs> schools are teaching people to do it that way. I actually did a couple little book trailers for one of my books, and a friend recommended this kid who just came out of film school here, photography. And constantly for the whole thing, everything we'd be trying to say would be like, oh, we're going to need you to screen screen for this. Oh, we're going to need you to mm -hmm. you know, do this in post. We're going to need this. And I have called in tons of papers from friends of mine who work in the film industry. And we're all staring at them like, what the hell are you talking about? 
we do this with a piece of black cloth. We don't need to green screen this. The, the movie, at least some of the best series of the last 30 years have really made it a fusion of everything available and everything that's been. Yeah, so Back to the Future series used all kinds of stuff, with models and practical things, and then you, you cast report into the Lord of the Rings movies. Regardless of what you think of how those stories compare, the presentation of the films for Lord of the Rings, they use everything. Yep. They use uh, you know the false perspective so that they've got people far enough away. You never see that like Elijah Wood is it's the real Elijah Wood, there's no mask, it's real Amy Kellen, but they are ten feet away from each other to create the size differential and they cut the wagon just to look that way, so at the right angle, it's perfect. It's the it's the steps. At the end of the first movie when they're all around the bed. Yeah. And Mr. Frodo's in bed, you can almost see that perspective working. But they also did that in some Disney movie too with Walter Brennan with the um, I forgot the name of it, it's an Irish movie, but Leopard Trump, they did that same perspective. Well, the Darby O'Gill, the Darby O'Gill, O'Gill, O'Gill yeah. they were all in the same shot, but they were different perspectives of each other to make it look like they were smaller. Well, here's the mistake. Mistake. You, could have to do that. you could put a model in the foreground, and you would actually stretch nylons, like women's nylons in front, to create a distance mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, then, yeah. and then you use what you call a diopter lens, which is actually split down the middle. It's two different lenses. Mm-hmm. Stick them together, and now both things are in focus. But this has a haze as, as if it's 20, 30 feet away, and those people mm-hmm. there are now. Before green screen and blue screen, there was yellow screen. Mm-hmm. This uh, certain acid based thing that Disney had. That was what Hitchcock used for some of his uh, process shots in mm-hmm. The Birds. Some of the different things that still hold up after 50 years. Yeah. You know, they, they knew what they were doing, but yeah, it's getting lost. This is almost mm-hmm. like tribal language or, you know, dead languages that are falling by the wayside, yet they still have application that's being disregarded for the sake of computers and all that kind of I apologize, we get off the subject matter, this is like movie remakes, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's all involved. It's all yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. So look what Raimi did practically. Yeah. And they're going to disregard it for the sake of just manufacturing for fake blood coming out, they're going to have to worry about dirty sheets. I'm kind of an avid movie goer myself, and mm-hmm. this new 3D thing they got coming out. And I agree with you too, with like I watched that movie Avatar, you know, it's like 95% you know, CGI. Yeah. But the only thing though, if you watch that in 3D, you kind of get immersed in the movie, which is kind of gorgeous. Cool. Yeah. It goes, you know? it goes this way. It's yeah. not trying to go this way. Right. But I just got finished watching the new Star Trek movie, and that 3D is kind of awesome. Okay. I had to duck the spears. I don't know if you've seen it or not in uh-huh. the beginning. I had to duck the spears. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty cool. Like the best part of the new Silent Hill movie. Well, then I this will be cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did go to the theater and I regret having a but the three D experience where you're sitting there and all the ash is falling in the theater. Mm. There's that one moment you're in the streets and the ash is falling and for that just brief moment you're like, oh, I'm fucking trying to go. It was awesome. Yeah, so that yeah. was literally the opening time. Costumes are the least interesting part of the Matrix. You're actually there for the story and fighting and everything else that goes on. 
the costumes. I've never heard anybody talk about this, really, other than Nicole. I'm told we have that money soon. I do want glasses. Okay, other than that, but they could be blue, and I wouldn't care. It's the they're trying to say that those make people pop because of flesh tones. Mm -hmm. If they're in clothes and they're any color, you'll notice there's a person there. I think it's just kind of a stupid brag to say that this is why something works or it's effective. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, you notice some more if they don't. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, you know, for all the Megan Fox stuff, they, she never got anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Even Jennifer's body, which are so open, you're like, it's got to happen. Don't okay. see that. Don't waste your time. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I hate my friend who recommends them. Do they hate you? I still talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought uh, when I first watched the Texas Chainsaw Hot reboot, I actually liked the color scheme of it because it felt really hot and gross yeah, and fuzzy. Right. But then, you know, the more I watch it, the more I realize that Jessica mm -hmm. Biel is the same color as her grass, is the same color as her hair, <laughs> and like everything is that sepia tone color. And then you kind of split off from that, and then after Transformers, every, every single person in all the movies is super tan, everything is really blue, you know, and it just looks. Awful, well, they can't be bothered to give them dirt on their face when they have something go wrong. You know, when shit is the fan, they have to try to go into a fucking Dr. James lair or whatever. They can't be bothered to, oh, actually, since the zombie did a really good job of keeping their faces all fucking gross. Everybody else kind of, kind of, you know, dropped the ball on that and they, they can't be bothered to mess that hair or dirty clothes or dirty face. Or dirty nails. Right. <laughs> right. You don't feel right from when a guy builds a chainsaw for what seems like days. And not even have like a twig in your hair. Yeah. <laughs> or just manicure or anything. Yeah. Or it's just mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but with that being said, you at least look at the Texas Chainsaw, which Texas Chainsaw reboot and Friday the 13th reboot were both done by Arms Missing. When you at least watch Texas Chainsaw, it's at least rainy, a little bit grimy, and it's dirty, and things are messy, and there's slime. And like at least, like, there's a scene where they go and pick the ring up out of the box. And a weird jello in there, you don't even know why, but at least there's like texture to that film. Mm -hmm. Then you go and watch the 13th, and it's so clean. Mm -hmm. Like everything is, the shrine is exactly like everything's perfect. There's no dust anywhere. And, like everything's just really almost sterile when you watch some of these movies. Like it's like an abandoned bar. And when he put that together, he was wearing a bag over his face, so you could, you know. Yeah. 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 Organize your dolls that or even um, Freddy's creepy little lawyer in the Nightmare on Elm Street reboot. Yeah, like, like, forever. Like, the cleanest, uh, <laughs> naked actors I've ever seen. We're going to resell that stuff on eBay after the fact. You guys can get it in the corner too. Don't you guys think budget factors into that though? A lack Not of really. budget? You know, there's yeah. a lack of budget factors in making it with grainy and shitty no. and gross. Do you think because, no. they, no. because they, they couldn't afford to keep it clean, they would have if they could have afforded it? Is that what you mean? Like low budget is dirty because... Uh, right. I, I, I have heard mention that John Carpenter, the only reason he went cheap and non-bloody in Halloween was because he couldn't afford to. Mm. Whether or not that's true remains to be seen, right? Oh. But that's what I've heard. So my guess is that with TCM being shot as cheap as shit as it was, the original, Right. Right. Toby Hooper, they, they were in fair bones. And in front of the 13th Chunk Hen, they didn't have a lot of money then either. Or even like Last House on the Left, same thing, they didn't have a lot of money then. Our movies are, are generally the cheapest movies ever made. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But that's, wouldn't you guys are, you know, maybe agree those are excessively cheap even for horror movies? Not at the time, no. I mean, no, no, they were. Give, the maybe time, not Last House on the Left, because I would think it's said it too, I get that. But, that, but. And Halloween and all. You know what the average horror movie costs, even today? Yes. I'd say probably less than a million. I think a million might be pushing most, it. Most horror movies are in for two million less. The most expensive horror movie ever made, depending on if we're going to call World War Z a horror movie or not, which I want to still wait for. Seriously, seriously. Guess what was the most expensive horror movie ever made? Well, guess what it was. First. The Shining? No. The most expensive horror movie ever made was The Sixth Sense. You know what its budget was? Sixty million. That's the most expensive horror we've ever made. Hollywood has never put money in the horror. I think mean, you just forced them to be more creative. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't necessarily well, mean that. No, it's, 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 it's never put in because it's the ghetto. Right. Uh, horror is the ghetto because nobody really wants to be associated with it. And they figured out that really aside from porn, <laughs> horror is the best thing <laughs> ever, where you don't have to put in much money, but you can mm -hmm. get a great return. Yeah. You know that you, you can solve 
was a one million dollar horror movie. I don't even think mm-hmm. it was a million dollar movie, but it made a hundred. Well, yeah. like with Halloween, uh, I know I've seen stuff on Carpenter talking about some of the long takes that he did because he wanted to make sure that he got everything and had plenty to work with because they didn't have extra film. Right. So in certain ways, you're like, why then why didn't you just stop before she got to the corner of the sidewalk when you already established she's walking? I, I believe she'll get there. <laughs> so I are actually watching, like, okay, well, cool, you don't want to waste your footage, but Jesus, come on, man. Like, I, I think that movie could have been probably five minutes shorter, mm-hmm. for as much as I still like the original Halloween. There's some stuff that's a little long. The intro is awesome. Mm-hmm. Going to the house, that, like, single shot that's probably actually broken maybe once or twice. Mm-hmm. But... Um, then there are some other things that are establishing shots that take forever, but you didn't want to waste actual film stock, which again is no concern now. Mm-hmm. So now you don't even have that excuse, and you should be able to cover, like, J- you know, uh, Jimmy the Curtis had to buy, buy and bring her own clothes. So I'm sure there's still that kind of stuff where you're not going to be able to afford eight shirts to have the eight different levels of uh, decrepitude, you know, that you're dealing with going through the course of the movie. But you can probably afford three, you know, and I mean, that nobody suffers any kind of. Uh, clothing injustice, you know, or hair injustice over the course of it. I, I don't think it's as much of an argument anymore that there's money, there's got to be at least somebody coming from somewhere and then it is kind of like she was saying, attention to detail. I think, yeah, connecting the, the budget thing with uh, what we said about everything being so pristine, I think that's just bad art direction. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, that's bad decision making from the art director. Yeah, if the content matter is dirty and grimy and horrible, then the movie should look dirty and grimy. Which is like stage dust is twenty bucks. Yeah, really. Yeah, and and most <laughs> most prop masters set people on the thing already have it. So do you guys know some do and some don't? Hmm? Some filmmakers do and some filmmakers don't? Don't. Do go above and beyond and try and make it look as grimy and grimy and realistic as possible. You don't think well, they, or they just don't think they have to. Right, right. Or they, they just don't get it. it. Yeah, I think they just don't get it. They yeah. look at something and go, all right, this is good enough to shut up. 